The Sony a7 III has been such a popular hybrid camera since its release way back in 2018 due to its low cost for an Alpha 7 camera and great balance of stills and video capabilities. Well today we are taking a look at the highly anticipated Sony a7 Mark IV. Let's get into it. The a7 IV is easily one of the most highly anticipated hybrid cameras of the last few years because of the popularity of the a7 III along with the price increase that the a7S III has had over previous generations. Sony were kind enough to lend us this unit for 48 hours to check out and run it through some tests. This won't be a full review as we've had such a short amount of time with the camera but we've tried to squeeze as much out of our time with the camera as possible. Anyway, let's start off looking at some creative test footage and stills we shot with the new camera. Due to getting the camera so late notice, it was hard to organise a proper shoot, so we decided to go down to Buckler's Forest for a little explore with the camera, as well as the A7S Mark III to capture some BTS imagery. After some time shooting with the camera, we do have some thoughts about what it was like to shoot with it. Unsurprisingly, if you have shot with a previous Alpha series camera, you will feel at home here. Though this camera along with the Alpha 1 and the A7S III are much better from a usability standpoint than all previous Alpha series cameras. The new mode dial at the top of the camera is awesome. It makes switching between the camera's photography, video and slow and quick mode really, really fast. Although the image out of the A7 IV is good, we did notice that when reviewing imagery on the back monitors on location, that the A7S III footage does look better tonally than the A7 Mark IV. The dynamic range looks to be not quite as good as what is capable out of the A7S Mark III. We recorded around 35 minutes of actual footage over around 6 hours, and we only changed the battery once, which is slightly different to Sony's rated numbers. The autofocus performance was also really good, it just didn't get in the way of us shooting, it just worked, which is what you want. The A7 IV features a newly developed 33 megapixel full frame backside illuminated sensor which is paired with the same Bionz XR processor featured in the Alpha 1 and the A7S Mark III. And this means it has 8 times the processing power of the previous Bionz X processor. This resolution puts it at a nice point in between the 12.1 megapixels of the A7S Mark III sensor and the 50.1 megapixels of the Alpha 1. This allows you to capture 3x2 stills with a resolution of 7008 by 4672 When recording in 4K30, the camera is using roughly 7K or 7008 by 3944 worth of the sensor and downsampling to 4K. When it comes to dynamic range, Sony has stated that you can capture 15 plus stops of dynamic range in video mode and 15 in stills as well. But we'll take a look at the sensor's performance in a bit. I mentioned in our Alpha 1 review that I wanted to see the sensor in a more cinema or video orientated camera, and this could also be the case here with this new sensor, but let's take a look at how it performs. We wanted to see how this new sensor performed, so we managed to shoot some very quick tests with the camera like we have in our previous controlled tests. For this we compared it against the A7S Mark III, and for these tests we made sure to expose our cameras using their own IRE values for mid-grey which is 41% for S-Log3 on both cameras. For underexposure we lit for T2 for us to then close down and for overexposure we lit for T16 and then opened up our lens. We changed the exposure a stop at a time all the way to 6 stops for overexposure and 5 for under using the same 50mm Zeiss Supreme Radiance. Each clip is then brought into Resolve so the charts can be normalised using the same process across each camera. The A7S III and A7 IV should be fairly comparable when it comes to exposure, but for some reason, even though we used the built-in zebras and aimed for 41% for our mid-grey chip on our Macbeth chart, when you bring the images into Resolve, they look around half a stop out when it comes to exposure. Now you're probably thinking, oh, this must be the difference in ISO between the two, but we actually changed the light in the scene to counteract this ever so slightly 
so it should be the same. Anyway, it doesn't make a massive difference to the results. When it comes to underexposure, even at optimal exposure, we can see a clear difference between the two cameras. The A7S III looks much better tonally and in regards to colour. I prefer the skin tone over the A7 Mark IV as well. This is a similar story down to three stops under, where we can start to see a purple shift come in on the A7 Mark IV. Both cameras are getting noisy at this point. At four stops under, we can see the purple shift more obviously on the A7 IV footage, though noise does look a touch better than the A7S Mark III, the overall colour and tone of the A7 IV is outclassed by the A7S Mark III. It looks like the A7 IV has more in-camera noise reduction than the A7S III. At five under, noise on both is bad, but I actually think the A7 IV has a bit more detail than the A7S III, which surprised me. However, like I said, colour is held so much better on the A7S III. When it comes to overexposure, the A7S III does edge it out slightly against the A7 IV. At three stops, both look pretty good. Even at the base exposure, the A7S III looks lower in contrast with smoother tones. The A7IV has much more contrast, but they both do look good overall. This is the same story all the way up to three stops over, but at four stops, we can see a clear difference between the two in both the charts and Sam's skin. At five, both of their charts start to shift, but they hold the blue chips well, which is what you want when shooting bright skies. As all of these cameras feature compressed internal codecs, as well as internal noise reduction, I wanted to see how the A7IV compares to the A7S Mark III, and whether or not there is a still a fakish dual base ISO like the A7S Mark III. As we can see if we step through the ISO stops while the lens has its port cap on, that there is obviously some heavy noise reduction going on as you step up the ISO range. However, the biggest and most obvious change is between 2500 and 3200 ISO, where you can really see the level of noise reduction change by looking at the image and the waveform here. For our ISO comparison tests, we shot the camera's port capped as well as this frame from our headshot setup. The A7IV has a maximum ISO of 102,400 in its video mode, which isn't quite as high as the 409,600 maximum ISO of the A7S Mark III. Unsurprisingly, the higher ISO performance isn't as good as the A7S Mark III, but given the A7IV's increased resolution and reduced photo site size, that isn't surprising. However, given the resolution of the sensor, the A7IV does a pretty good job here. You could easily shoot up to 12,800 or 25,600 ISO and get good results with a bit of noise reduction in post. When compared to the R6 and the A7 Mark III, the A7 IV is much better as you get up into the higher ISOs. The A7 III is unsurprisingly the worst performer, with the R6 trailing the A7 IV, but it's still quite good. Sony has produced some incredibly fast rolling shutter sensors over the past few years, so I wanted to see how fast this new 33 megapixel one was in comparison to the A7S Mark III, which has become the gold standard amongst mirrorless cameras. If we look at our fan here, we can see that the A7IV's readout speed can't handle the speed of our fan. And this performance really isn't great, especially when we compare it to the very good performance that the A7S Mark III has. When we even compare it to the A7 III, it pales in comparison. This is very surprising given that this sensor is a newly developed one from Sony, and their most recent sensors have had really fast readout times for full frame sensors. This performance will put some people off for video use, but there are other cameras on the market that suffer like this that people still manage to shoot video with. So depending on the scenario you shoot, this can look fine, but anything that moves fast in your image or when you pan fast will result in skewed lines. When it comes to aliasing, if we look at a recording of our chart here of each format back to back, we can see that the camera does suffer from aliasing in the middle of our frame here. The 4K 30 footage looks the best, with more aliasing being visible when you use the 1080p formats over the 4K ones. Our customer base and our YouTube audience definitely leans more towards video and cinema production, so our focus when looking over the functions within the A7 Mark IV will be the ones mainly focused on shooting video. One of the largest improvements that the A7 Mark IV has gained over the A7 III is the improved video recording formats. The A7 IV can shoot 4K 30p using the full width of the sensor while also downsampling roughly 7K into that 4K recording, while also capturing 10-bit 422. This downsampling process will do several things to improve the image quality, such as noise floor, color depth, and increased detail. And you can see this in the footage. It looks very detailed. If you want to shoot at 4K 60, you'll have to go into the camera's Super 35 mode, which again is downsampling, but 4.8K's worth of the sensor this time. This also looks pretty good given the crop on the sensor. 
When it comes to formats, the a7 IV can record in XAVC HS 4K, XAVC S 4K, XAVC S HD, XAVC S I 4K, and XAVC S I HD. These XAVC SI or intraframe versions of XAVC S are the big ones to be added here, and the HS formats are the H65 variants of XAVC. This is similar to what was added into the A7S III, so it's great to see all of the improvements we saw with that camera here as well. The improved chroma subsampling and bit depth available will make grading S-Log footage so much better, and you will not experience the negative effects such as banding when grading 8-bit 420 footage. You can also swap between PAL and NTSC, and this will change what base rate frame rates are available. In NTSC, you have 24, 30, and 60, and in PAL, you have 25 and 50. This will also change the available streaming resolutions via the USB-C outputs. As with the FX3, the A7 Mark IV features 11 picture profiles instead of the 10 in the A7S Mark III. This includes everything you expect from a Sony Alpha line camera, like S-Log2, S-Log3, and a range of HLG options. However, it also includes s Cinetone, which has been designed as a quick turnaround acquisition look that takes inspiration from the film colour found in the Venice with S709 and provides images with a more cinematic look in tone and colour for the video world. In S-Log2 and S-Log3, the base ISO is 800, which is different to the 640 of the A7S Mark III and the base ISO in s is 125. We did a video detailing s and S-Log earlier this year, so I would suggest checking that out if you are planning on picking up any Sony camera for video. As with other Alpha series cameras, you have the ability to switch into slow and quick mode. This allows you to shoot from 1 FPS all the way up to the max frame rates that each resolution can handle that we mentioned earlier. Sony has held back slightly on the slow motion capabilities of this camera as it can only shoot 4K30 or Full HD 120 while also using the full field of view of the sensor or up to 4K60 while in its Super 35 mode. This will probably disappoint some people, but I think that it's most likely a choice by Sony to keep the camera below the capabilities of the A7S Mark III, FX3 and Alpha 1, considering the large price difference between them. When we look at our controlled high frame rate tests, you can see a difference between the two cameras. The A7 IV footage looks great, but the A7S III does look a lot smoother. It definitely has the edge over the A7 Mark IV, but that's not surprising, and for most, the slow-mo out of the A7 IV will be enough for most low-end productions. The A7 IV features the same updated menu system that we saw in the A7S Mark III, and this means it's much nicer to operate than previous Alpha series cameras, and features similar functions within the menu. So let's take a look through some of the interesting functions that are featured within the camera. A new tool that's been added into the A7 IV and isn't in any other of the Sony Alpha camera lineup is lens breathing correction. If you have watched any of our previous lens reviews, you will have often heard us mention lens breathing. Breathing is a term used to describe the slight focal length change that can happen when moving through a lens's focus range. It's a characteristic that is common in stills lenses as it is something that will not be noticed when capturing a single frame. But with moving image, it can be seen as distracting, so most cine lenses are optically designed to minimise focus breathing. So considering that most people shooting video on the a7 IV will be using E-mount stills lenses, this could be a really good feature to help reduce this characteristic for people not wanting it in their footage. This will only be available with certain E-mount lenses, and it looks to have slightly crop in on the frame to achieve this. This is most likely because the camera needs the breathing characteristic profile built into the lens, and this is most likely why only at the moment Sony lenses work with this. This function is within the lens compensation setting in the main menu, and will be disabled if the lens you have attached to the camera isn't compatible. We managed to test it with a few different E-mount lenses to see how it worked. In this example here, we are using a Sony G Master 16-35 f2.8, which suffers from some pretty heavy breathing at 35 mm. We can then toggle it on in the menu, and you can see the crop difference here, but voila, no more focus breathing. Now of course, the crop is a downside, but if you are using E-mount lenses that suffer from breathing, which honestly is quite a lot of them, this could be a really awesome way of circumventing it when you need to. The second new feature that has been added to the a7 IV that isn't featured in any other Sony Alpha camera is the focus map tool. Now this is a new manual focusing tool, which is kind of like false color, but for what's in focus or not. It looks to be using the same tech that has been built into Sony sensors and cameras for a while now to map this out. Blue is behind your depth of field, white or your regular image is within your depth of field, and orange or red is in front of your depth of field. This is an interesting idea, but I think it needs some work. Currently, you can only toggle it on or off. You can't tweak any settings. This means that composing an image can be pretty difficult because sometimes it's transparent and sometimes it's not. 
it really needs a transparency setting for it to be really considered usable while composing. It also seems to work better in nicer lit scenarios, but it just feels pretty hit and miss. It's an intriguing addition, but one that I think Sony needs to work on to get to the same kind of level as Canon's manual focus assist that they use. The a7 IV has a very similar autofocus system to the Alpha 1 and the a7S Mark III. And this means that performance is much better from the system in the a7 III, but that's not surprising given the a7 III's age now. The a7 IV features a hybrid system with 759 phase detection points, which covers approximately 94% of the frame. It also features all of the same improvements when it comes to tracking and eye tracking for various subjects that the a7S III had. In its stills and video mode, the camera features human face and eye tracking as well as animal and bird tracking. It's awesome to see the full autofocus system working in video now, as well as when using the HDMI output or USB-C output for streaming. Focus can also be controlled via the Imaging Edge app, which could be handy. But yeah, from our very limited time with the camera, it performed very well in this regard. The a7 IV features an improved image stabilization system over the a7 III, which brings it in line with the same system as the a7S Mark III. This new system is able to achieve 5.5 stops of stabilization. In the menu, you can choose between three different modes, off, steady shot, and active. Steady shot is your regular IBIS that Sony has had in their cameras for a while now. Active mode is designed for video acquisition and aims to optimize the system for handheld video shooting. This then crops in on the image to electronically stabilize the footage by 12.5%. This does a solid job at stabilizing the image and could be really handy if you're in a run and gun scenario with no stabilization. Just like the Alpha 1, the a7 IV features the same interval shoot function, which will be really handy considering how the camera is being pitched as a jack of all trades for hybrid shooters who may need to shoot a time lapse at some point. Within the menu system, you can change a range of parameters for shooting time lapses pretty decently. This, along with its other stills features, could make it a really solid option for owners of the FX3, 6, or 9 wanting a B or C camera that can capture good stills and video. Other than that, there are a few other standout functions that have returned from previous Alpha series cameras. Let's quickly go through them. You have zebras, which are a great way to make sure you're exposed to get the most out of your footage. You can also shoot proxies, and what format and resolution you can shoot will depend on what normal format you want to use. To shoot proxies in XAVCSI, for example, you will need to use a CF Express Type A card. While you can't ingest your own LUTs into the camera, it does feature a gamma display assist function, which you can toggle between auto and a range of presets depending on what you are shooting in, or you can just leave it to auto. I did also run into a little bit of overheating when shooting externally via the HDMI, but this was with the auto power off temp set to standard and not high. If this is something you want to try and avoid running into, make sure you head into the menu and toggle this to high instead of standard. It also features a synchro scan mode where you can dial in the shutter speed by 0.1 so that way you can get rid of flicker on certain lights where you need to adjust the shutter speed to do that. Another weird feature that we found is a soft skin filter. This looks to be made for content creators who want internal skin smoothing. It looks incredibly odd, but there might be someone somewhere who could use this. And I don't really think that we're the target audience for this feature. With live streaming and live production booming over the last few years, it's unsurprising that the a7 IV features a range of connectivity options that content creators, filmmakers and videographers can take advantage of if they need to ever stream or connect to their camera for offloading or control to a computer. The camera features Bluetooth as well as 2.4 and 5 GHz Wi-Fi options. Streaming via USB is a popular feature that many cameras have now started to get and the a7 IV features an updated USB-C port which allows better resolution and frame rate output over previous cameras. Getting this set up is also much easier than with previous Alpha series cameras as when you plug in a USB-C cable now it will pop up with a USB streaming option which you can now just simply confirm and get the camera's output into a range of popular communication programs as well as most streaming software. It's really simple, when you plug the camera in it just pops up in OBS as its name where you can then just simply hit add and it's in. This updated USB-C output on the a7 IV can now output 4K 15p or Full HD 30 and 60p which is a massive improvement over the a7S III and a7 III which use the same Imaging Edge webcam software which is limited to 576p. While YouTube does allow users to stream in 4K, Twitch does not. So I think the 1080p modes will definitely be the most popular out of the two due to the increased frame rate options. However, the option to stream 4K without the need for a 4K capture card is a pretty awesome feature to have and 15p may be enough for some people as a webcam, though I do wish they'd maybe stretched up to maybe 24, 25. 
One quick note is if you want to get 15p instead of 12.5p, you'll need to make sure the camera is in NTSC mode, not PAL. You can also record internally while outputting via USB if you need to, which could be handy. As the a7 IV is aimed at being a hybrid camera through and through, I think it's only fair we mention its performance as a stills camera. We have used an a7 III in the studio as our primary stills camera for a few years now and have been meaning to upgrade it for a while. The a7 IV has the same 10fps maximum capture as the a7 III, but one of the largest upgrades over the a7 III is the increased buffer and speed. From our very basic tests, when using CF Express, I could not get it to buffer more than single digits, which cleared pretty much instantly. However, when using a V90 SD card, the camera gets to about 50 shots in and then buffers with around 20 in the buffer, and it then has to clear to get back capturing at high frames per second. And of course, all of this burst is without any blackout in your viewfinder or LCD. Physically, the a7 IV is incredibly similar to the a7S Mark III, so it feels much more solid, larger, and more robust in the hand than the a7 III. It features the same digital multi-interface shoe, a nice large dedicated record button, a 3-inch 1.03 million dot very angled touch rear LCD panel, the same MPF Z100 battery, and more. It also has the same cooling system that is in the a7S III, which means it's much more robust and effective than the one found in the a7 III. However, it does have a different EVF, a 3.69 million dot OLED QVGA viewfinder, which is an improvement over the a7 III, but it's not quite as high resolution or nice to use as the a7S III's. The camera also features a new dial design. Under the dial for controlling your exposure mode, there is also a dial for swapping between stills, movie, and slow and quick modes. This will make switching on the fly really quick, as all you have to do is press the button at the front and then just turn it. It's in a really good position for your index finger if you're holding the camera normally. It also has had its exposure compensation dial changed to a locking dial, which you can customize in the menu. It also has a slightly tweaked card slot setup. It's still a dual card slot, but one is limited to just SD and the other is a multi-use slot that can take SD or CF Express Type A. In terms of I.O., it has a full-size HDMI output, a 3.5mm headphone output and a microphone input, a USB-C port and a micro USB multi-port. These are covered by the same improved covers featured on the A7S Mark III, so they're really nice and robust, not flappy like the A7S III's. When we compare the A7 IV to the rest of the camera market, we can look at it as a hybrid camera or as a sole video camera. If we look at it as a hybrid camera, it is one of the more expensive cameras in its category, with the likes of the Canon R6 and the Panasonic S5 costing a good chunk less than the A7 Mark IV. Though they are lower resolution sensors and have a slightly different set of video features, the S5 is quite a bit cheaper, while also offering some unique video tools and still producing some awesome footage though it does lack a mature focusing system and lens ecosystem. The R6 does lack in its video format department, but it is a fantastic stills camera. Really though, they all have pros and cons. And if you want some help making a choice as to what camera's best for you, make sure to get in contact with us via the contact details below. When it comes to the more video orientated cameras, it becomes a bit more of a difficult decision. If you think about the camera as a stills camera, it's pretty well featured but it's still lacking some of the video orientated tools such as shutter angle, force color, anamorphic D-squeeze and much more than other cameras in its price point do. However, it does have one of the best autofocus systems on the market, great looking downsampled 4K and some interesting new features other cameras do not have yet. But for the money, I do think for some, there may be some more interesting options out there. However, it is currently one of the most affordable full frame cameras with the ability to shoot 4K intra frame Force 2 10 bit internally with amazing autofocus, and that could be a killer for some. The Sony a7 IV is easily one of the most anticipated cameras that have come out this year. And while it certainly isn't a perfect camera, it will be a fantastic upgrade for people coming from the a7 III wanting another solid hybrid camera from Sony that can just do it all. However, in my eyes, the Alpha One is still the hybrid camera to beat, and for video orientated users, there are plenty of reasons to pick up the a7S III over the a7 Mark IV. My biggest disappointment with the camera has to be the rolling shutter performance. It's much worse than I expected from a new Sony sensor, and for some, this will be a real deal breaker. However, for people doing a 50-50 mix of stills and video, looking at a camera at this price range, the a7 IV is a solid option, with plenty to love. Let us know what you think of the Sony a7 Mark IV down in the comments below. And if you liked the video, please give us a like and maybe consider subscribing. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.